Good morning. Um, as you can see, my name's David. I'm a um, professor of nursing at the University of Winchester, the UK's newest school of nursing. Um, so we're two weeks into our first intake. Um, so far, the students have survived, we've survived, so it uh, can't be bad. Um, so what I wanted to talk to you about this morning is moisture-associated skin damage something that's probably very familiar to most of you, um, and then sort of focus more on one aspect of it that tends to be a bit neglected, purely because people often don't know what to do with it. And that's the uh, subject of intertrigo. So in order to understand how moisture damages the skin, we just need to think about the functions of the skin. So take you back to the dim distant past when you would have looked at this, so things that you'll remember. So principally then the skin is obviously a physical barrier. It maintains, um, well, it protects us from the external environment. It's also a moisture barrier, not only prevents moisture coming in, but obviously importantly, prevents too much moisture going out. Um, and obviously that's the main aspect that gets damaged if we put too much moisture into the mix and we get moisture-associated skin damage. Obviously, temperature control, uh, vitamin D synthesis. Um, interestingly, I was at uh, a meeting a couple of weeks ago where somebody was measuring vitamin D levels in nurses and looking at how it differed over the year and how it differed with long shifts. And certainly this time of year, well, actually, it didn't make much difference what time of the year, you were all vitamin D deficient because you basically didn't get enough sunlight because you were either going to work early in the morning when the, um, the UVB's low and you were coming home in the afternoon or in the evening, again, when there wasn't any UVB and actually not getting outside in between times. So a cheery little thought. Um, obviously also acts as a, a sensory organ as well. So we generally divide the skin into sort of three main layers. The epidermis, the, out, the outer layer, which we'll go into in a little bit more detail in a moment. The dermis, which is the thicker layer below, that's the bit that contains the blood vessels, hair follicles, um, etc and then the subcutaneous level. So if we just focus a bit on the outer layer, so the stratum corneum particularly. So if you remember the epidermis, the very outer layer is called the stratum corneum. Um, we typically think of this as being a sort of bricks and mortar type structure, and I'm sure you've heard it described as this before. So we have the sort of cornea sites, the cells, actually embedded and linked together in this sort of lipid matrix. So the cornea sites are the bricks and the lipid matrix is the mortar that holds it together. So the analogy of, of a sort of brick wall. And that's really what gives the skin its barrier function. So quite important. You were probably taught though that the stratum corneum is fairly boring. The cells are dead, they don't have nuclei, they just sort of sit there and eventually they come off. Yeah? How wrong is that? We now know that actually this is one of the most dynamic areas of the skin. Really interesting. So interesting, I can see it's really lighting you up. Yeah? I can see from your faces, you're as interested in the stratum corneum as I am. Um, but really, really interesting area. This is the bit that actually obviously has to respond quickly to what's going on on the outside. This is the bit that responds if there's too much moisture. And we now know actually it can respond very quickly and chuck out some quite nasty inflammatory mediators. So a lot of work going on actually exploring what's happening. So what happens then with too much moisture? What happens is that the um, moisture can actually get in to the stratum corneum and it starts dissolving those lipids. 
sort of makes sense. So it washes away the mortar, it washes away the cement that's holding everything tightly together. Now what we do know is that what also happens, particularly with urine, is that as the urine goes in, Obviously, some of it will come back out again and evaporate, but the salts in the urine actually crystallise out in the skin. So what happens is as the moisture goes in, it creates these little pockets. Those pockets fill with the salts from the fluid that's evaporated. And what do you know about salt and fluid movement? If I say to you, osmosis, yeah, yeah, come back to haunt you, come back to bite you on the bum. So what happens is it creates an osmotic pull, yeah? So the next time there's fluid, or the next time there's moisture, can you see it will actually be pulled into the skin more than the first time, if that sort of makes sense. So we get this sort of vicious cycle of frequent exposure to moisture, and obviously the commonest co source of that moisture is incontinence of urine. Can you see how that actually will set up this vicious cycle of actually more moisture going in, more damage happening? So how quickly can that, can that happen? Well, we know that certainly with moisture-associated skin damage, some types can happen within three hours. So it really emphasises the need for adequate assessment, adequate prevention, and we'll look at some of that in a moment. So what is moisture-associated skin damage then? So a term that's been around for a while, I'm sure you've all heard of it. Um, it's defined as inflammation and erosion of the skin, obviously caused by prolonged exposure to moisture. We've just looked at how that prolonged exposure can actually start vicious cycles. Where does the moisture come from? Obviously urine or stool. We know that um, actually, well, what's more damaging, formed stool or liquid faeces? Yeah, liquid faeces. So again, the patient who has the raging squits, to use that technical term, um, obviously there's going to be lots of digestive enzymes in that liquid stool that really damages the skin as well, and, and we, know, we know that. But it can come from excess perspiration, it can come from wound exudate, and you've heard Simon talking about some of that. Um, mucus, obviously particularly around um, a tracheostomy, and I'm sure we've all seen the sort of gunk that can uh, come out of a tracheostomy. Um, and obviously saliva, and saliva particularly in babies, particularly drooling, they can end up with moisture-associated skin damage in their necks and such. So a range of sources. The common factor, though, is excess moisture being in contact with the skin and causing damage. So we generally think of there being four types. So, moisture-associated skin damage, then, is an umbrella term. Okay, so it's an umbrella term encompassing four main conditions, if you like. So we've got peristomal dermatitis, so obviously inflammation around a stoma, particularly ileostomy. Again, it's that liquid faeces, the liquid effluent, um, and most of you will have seen ileostomies that actually cause quite bad excoriation if the sort of stoma care um, protocol is not quite right. One that most people think of when we talk about moisture-associated skin damage, and that's IAD, or incontinence-associated dermatitis. Lots of work recently gone into that, um, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and certainly the one that's come to the fore lately, you will be familiar with NHS Improvement wanting you now to actually record moisture damage, moisture lesions. Slight problem with that, if I say to you moisture lesion, 
perhaps I should have asked you at the beginning, but if I say to you moisture lesion, what do you think of? Out of those four, what immediately comes to mind? IAD, yeah? And certainly lots of trusts, that's all they're reporting, is IAD. When in fact, actually what is needed and what is wanted is all moisture damage. So we're going to, slight problem. So whilst we thought things might be better and we would get accurate data, can you see actually what's going to happen is we're only going to get data on IAD. So the whole range of moisture associated skin damage isn't going to be recorded. So we won't really know true incidents. So a slight problem. And you're probably sat there thinking, oh my God, you know, it's bad enough having another thing to fill in. You know, we've got the VTE thing to fill in, we've got falls risk, we've got this, that and the other to fill in. Now they want us to record, yeah, moisture damage. And we haven't got time to look at each one. Yes, yeah, yeah, and, and, and that's the sort of thinking, is because we know, and you know, there is a high um, correlation between incontinence-associated dermatitis and pressure damage. We know there's that correlation. People, again, just think, sort of tunneled vision, and just think incontinence-associated dermatitis. So yes, you're quite right but it's thinking wider. Now, as we'll see when we go along, particularly with um, intertriginous dermatitis, bit of a mouthful, and I put my teeth back in, um, otherwise known as intertrigo. Um, intertrigo can occur in the groin, and that's actually one of the most common sites. Intertrigo can often be confused with IAD. Yeah? And very often, common sense goes out the window, as we'll see in a moment. So the four types of moisture-associated skin damage then, peristomal dermatitis, incontinence-associated dermatitis, peri-wound dermatitis that you've sort of heard about from Simon, and intertriginous dermatitis, or intertrigo. So all of those then caused by moisture, or there being too much moisture, potentially in the wrong place, at the wrong time. The symptoms are the same for all of them. All of them then, because it's an inflammation, there'll be erythema, so redness, there'll be itching, burning, and quite possibly erosion. Okay. So they all show the same signs. So if we look at each one in a bit more detail, so peristomal dermatitis then, um, there is a standard definition that it's sort of, you know, up to four inches around the stoma. It's redness, etc., and inflammation. Um, I've mentioned that it's particularly a problem with ileostomies. It can occur with any stoma, so even a sort of peg. Um, but more commonly associated with ileostomies due to the nature of the effluent that's coming out. They say rich in digestive enzymes. Um, we know it tends to be a problem early following stoma creation. And most of the work shows that actually within the first year, up to 80% of patients will suffer peristomal dermatitis. <coughs> okay, so that's a high number. Um, and it tends to be certainly the first year, and we think that's probably linked to developing self-care skills, which sort of makes sense. The person's getting used to their stoma, what works for them, um, and ultimately, they should be the experts. It's their stoma, they should know what works for them. Okay. But obviously need the tools to be able to manage flare-up should they occur, and then know when to ask for help if they need it. So various treatments, obviously barrier powders, pastes, rings, lotions, potions, whole range of things, um, and obviously making sure that the actual stoma appliance fits properly. Going on to IAD, so I say this is the one where there's been a lot of work lately, and probably, the, as I say, the one that comes to mind first. Um, 
Interestingly, until fairly recently, most of these, if I talk about the um, ICD-10, ICD-11, does that ring bells with anyone? Yeah, I'm getting that strange look that, you know, when's this guy going to shut up and go away? <laughs> <laughs> so the WHO have this International Classification of Diseases, okay? And you're probably thinking, oh, how exciting. Yes, where can I find it? Um, you can Google it and find it online if, if you're that sad. Um, basically, it offers a standard definition for every disease that could possibly get you, okay? And has a code. Now, you're thinking, yeah, so what? What it does is, obviously, ultimately, it means that in healthcare systems, money can go, yeah, to the patient. Not so much in the UK, but certainly in systems like in the US, um, unless something is actually IC features in the ICD, they, you won't get reimbursement because it doesn't exist. Does that make sense? The disease doesn't exist unless it's in the ICD. Yeah? So everything is coded. All of you will work in trusts where there will be clinical coders. Probably heard of them. They normally live in the basement in the dark, yeah, not very good social skills, so keep them out of the way. Um, their job is, is to literally, again, attach patient diagnoses to ICD codes, and ultimately in the NHS, money flows, yeah, it's all very boring. Now, why am I going on about this? It's also useful research-wise, because it gives us a definition. It means we're all looking at the same thing. Does that make sense? We're not looking for different things. You don't look convinced. Well, anyway, until fairly recently, moisture-associated skin damage didn't feature. Nappy rash in kids did, but that's totally different. Yeah, it's not the same thing. Now, each one features, and it's actually quite nice. So if anybody's interested, it comes under the EK2 codes. Woo, can't wait to look that one up. But anyway, so what, what it's done is it means that those of us sort of looking into these areas, we're all coming at it from the same viewpoint, okay? And it just makes life easier. So what we do know is, again, it's a type of irritant contact dermatitis. Um, we know that very often there's increased susceptibility to bacterial colonisation and fungal colonisation, and as I've said earlier, also increased likelihood of pressure damage. The two go together, but very often difficult to distinguish. So when we talk about moisture lesions, this is what most people are thinking of. Yeah. So treatment, obviously cleansing, assessing the damage, um, some of you might be aware there are now, or actually back in, I think it was 2015, there was a very good consensus document came out, which again is freely available online, um, well worth a read, and it actually takes you through everything there is to know about IAD and treatment and management. Okay. Um, obviously I would say it's good because I helped write it. Um, and then the other one, that's the only reason these are up here, because you know, some, some person not a million miles away was involved in them. Um, the other one is there's now an um, assessment tool, because I know how you, you, know, you love an assessment tool. Yeah? If you haven't got an assessment tool, then it's not a proper nursing problem, is it? Yeah? So just to keep everybody happy, there's the Globiad, which is a, a, a quite simple assessment and categorization tool, um, which is useful to use. Quite useful if you're wanting to evaluate whether what you're doing is working in a more structured way. Yeah. Peri wound dermatitis, won't spend too long on this, because hopefully Simon talked about this, but obviously um, this is where the moisture in the form of wound exudate is starting to damage the surrounding skin. Um, again, very often, 
there's problems. We, we know it tends to be more with chronic wound exudate. Acute wound exudate actually isn't damaging, generally, because it actually biochemically is quite different. So chronic wounds, particularly leg ulcers, because they contain lots of matrix metalloproteinases and all of that rubbish, um, tends to directly damage the skin. So treatment management, obviously appropriate dressing selection, protecting the peri-wound skin, so use of protectants if needed, but being careful because lots of people start thinking um, emollients, i.e. moisturisers, are like the same as barrier products. They're not. And obviously not all barrier products are equal. That's another story for another day. Um, and just being careful that in moisture-associated skin damage, you generally don't want to moisturise. It should be common sense. You know, most of you are sat there nodding, but you see it time and time again clinically. People just get into the mindset, because their skincare protocol talks about moisturisation, anybody you know, within a 500-yard radius gets greased up, whether they want it or not, and people don't think about what they're actually doing. Yeah. Okay, so one that we're going to focus on then, so intertriginous dermatitis, or intertrigo. Um, so this, again, is caused by moisture. This time the moisture comes in the form of perspiration that gets trapped, particularly in the skin folds. So symptoms, much the same as all the other types of moisture-associated skin damage. So we've got erythema, inflammation, but this time it happens, say, in the skin fold. So here you can see classic intertrigo presentation, obviously under the breasts, which again is one of the most common areas. So you'll see the mirror yeah, image, mirror erythema. So people often talk about kissing ulcers. Yeah, this is sort of what you get. Um, real erythema. Um, and I don't know if you can sort of see that, that sort of speckling away from the main erythema area. That's classic candida, so classic fungal infection, the satellite lesions of, of candida. So, can, so presents, so it starts off with erythema. If nothing's done, if it's not managed, it can quickly proceed to erosion, real inflammation, um, exudation and cause obviously quite a bit of pain um, and actually obviously lower quality of life. So symptoms tend to be aggravated by hot and humid conditions so obviously we tend not to have a problem with that here <laughs> but more common than you think so how common is it? Um, probably in most of the sort of moisture associated skin damage forms this is the one that's not been looked at that much quite simply because until fairly recently we didn't really know what to do about it um, which we'll explore in a moment but we know that certainly um, the sort of incidence figures vary depending on what you look at um, there isn't really any good incidence data and as just discussed with moisture lesion reporting in the UK, that ain't going to change. <laughs> We're not going to get any good, good detail. Um, it varies from about 16% up to 45% up to more, depending on your patient group. Higher incidence in obesity, and it's certainly linked with obesity. The other problem with intertrigo is obviously there's lots of different diseases, dermatological diseases, that affect the skin folds. So sometimes it's missed um, and it depends who the patient actually goes to see. So we've got problems with that. Um, last year JCN did an online survey, some of you may have taken part, um, actually looking at intertrigo. Um, you won't be able to see what that's showing because I can't see it from here. So. You don't stand a chance at the back. Um, 
but basically showing, so asking how often do you see patients with intertrigo, you'll see people are seeing it quite a bit and your own experience may, may support that. So inflammation of the skin folds basically into trigo, you're probably seeing that on an almost daily basis, some of you. Problem comes with what do you call it and you'll see, well, a multitude of things. People just actually don't know what to call it. Um, and the terms vary depending on um, patient. Um, so it can be present as trench foot, it can present as jock itch, yeah, so a whole range of lovely terms that you might hear, but actually it's all into trigo. Yeah. So we have problems as such. So the three key factors then that cause into trigo, that actually cause the damage. So we've got excess moisture from perspiration and obviously in the skin fold. So you imagine somebody's large abdominal skin fold, okay? We know that actually due to changes with the um, autonomic nervous system that larger patients actually perspire more. There's going to be more moisture that gets trapped in the skin folds. It's got nowhere to go. Yeah? We know that wet skin has a higher friction coefficient, i.e. it's stickier. So wet skin is more susceptible to friction damage. Yeah? So what's going to happen is the wet skin, you've got skin fold. Yeah? So skin on skin, it's wet, it's sticky. It's going to rub together, cause friction. So you can see how the damage quickly occurs. At the same time, because it's a dark, damp, dingy place, yes? Um, obviously, any of the bacteria or fungi that happen to be around, and remember we're covered, yeah, it's the new thing, isn't it? The skin microbiome. Yeah, have you noticed how companies are starting to jump on the bandwagon? Protect your skin microbiome. Load of rubbish. Um, <laughs> anyway, their skin microbiome, obviously, <coughs> gets a bit excited and a bit imbalanced. So bacterial and fungal infections, quite common. So we've got a triad then of factors that make up into trigo. So how do you identify it? So it comes back to, you know, is it a moisture lesion? Is it a, a, is it a pressure injury, pressure ulcer? Um, depending on which country you're in. You'll see that the key factor is location, and it only occurs where there are skin folds. So obviously, breasts, axilla, necks in children, particularly babies, um, abdomen, obviously the large skin folds of the abdomen, groin. Um, knee is quite common, actually, the back of the knee, again, in larger patients. That's quite a common area. Um, presents as a range of things, so there we've got in the groin, oops, trying to find a pointer, and that again could be mistaken for IAD. Yeah, how would you know that's into trigo and not IAD? Okay, or before that? <coughs> yeah, is the patient continent? And that tends to be the, the simple thing that often gets forgotten. Yeah? If the patient's continent, it cannot be IAD. Yeah? And the number of times I've had that conversation with people, so I would have been asked to go and see somebody. Um, yeah, raging red groin, and the patient's just gone out to the loo. Yeah, so I'd be sort of at the nurse's station looking at the notes or whatever, and I'd say, oh yeah, they've got dreadful IAD. What, that patient's just gone to the loo? Yeah, awful IAD. Patient's just come back from the loo. Yeah, really, really bad IAD. Really? <laughs> yeah. So, and it's easy to do. We know what, the, you know what it's like in the real world. You've got a million and one things to do. How are you going to survive the shift, let alone, you know, is it moisture-associated skin damage? Is it the pressure ulcer? 
who cares? <laughs> yeah, I need a coffee. So what happens if, if it's not treated then? Well, obviously, it will um, just get worse. Secondary infection, um, and it can develop into a lifelong chronic condition. So particularly in bariatric patients, they often have chronic intertrigo. And interestingly, um, we've created another group of patients who suffer from intertrigo, probably more than bariatric, and that's bariatric patients who are not bariatric anymore, if that makes sense. So the patients who rapidly lose weight, yeah, particularly they've had a gastric band or, or something, and they, as you know, end up with huge amounts of excess skin. Yeah, that has really driven into trigo. And very often that can only be treated by surgery. Yeah. So, interesting dilemma there. So, what commonly causes problems with intertrigo? So the common secondary infections then, uh, first one we've already talked about, candida, so the classic satellite lesions. So common sense should tell you they're going to need an antifungal. Yeah? The intertrigo won't clear up without actually treating the candida as well. So a simple antifungal. Be careful though because most antifungals come in the form of a cream. Yeah, which potentially adds more moisture. So you can see how you're going to need really good skin care um, and that cream actually has to be cleared daily. Yeah, otherwise it will just add to the moisture, add to the stickiness and the vileness that lurks. Yeah. So basically what goes in has to come back out again at some stage. So it may need vet's gloves, a miner's helmet, and be a two-person job in the very large patients. Think of health and safety. Um, just to orientate you, that's the back of a child's neck, an infant's neck. So just by your reaction, hopefully, if you came across something like this, you would recognise, oh, that's not right. <laughs> yes, that's serious. Um, this is um, obviously a strep, a group, group A, beta hemolytic strep, so that sort of smacked face, well, real, you know, fiery red, classic sign of, of a strep infection. Obviously something like that, no messing, that's basically an emergency. They need antibiotics quickly, yeah, so you prefer that on. So really it's just to show you that the real nasties are easy to spot. Yeah. Um, the other one that's quite common, uh, apologies, the picture doesn't show it too well, but this is obviously in somebody's armpit, and can you notice that brown discoloration? It's like a sort of staining. And that's called erith erythrasma, um, and it's caused by a particular bacteria, Corinibacterium, which some of you may know is the same bacteria, or, or there's a species of that bacteria that causes diphtheria. Not this one, thankfully, but it's the same sort of family. But what it does do is it causes this brown discoloration again in the skin folds. So it's a form of intertrigo, but obviously it has to be treated differently because it won't respond to antifungals because it's not a fungus. Um, and actually, in most cases, it doesn't really need treating. It normally is self-limiting, um, if the patient's really worried, because very often they'll come in and complain that they just feel dirty, because they've got this brown stain and they can't get rid of, particularly in the groins, that's where it's, it's actually more common. Um, the, the only other reason I mention it is it can, it's um, linked quite closely to diabetics, and particularly type 2 diabetes. And it, I've had a couple of cases where this has been the first sign that somebody had undiagnosed type 2 diabetes. So if somebody presents, they're not known as a diabetic and they've got all the other sort of characteristics, it would be rude not to just check their blood sugars, really. Yeah. So as you do anyway, if you sit still long enough in hospital these days, you 
somebody will come along and do a BM stick whether you want it or not. In, in most cases it will. It takes a long time. So the question was, does the brown staining resolve? In, in most cases it does. Um, so again, thinking about antibiotic stewardship, because it would be treated with antibiotics. Um, and as you all know, we're trying not to use antibiotics where possible. So if you can advise the patient and, and support them to not have antibiotics, it should go eventually. Um, if they really want treating, then obviously treat it according to local protocol. Um, but I say bearing in mind good stewardship. But it's not life-threatening. So it's not going to kill them. Um, whereas obviously that would, <laughs> potentially. Okay, so treatment then. What can we do? Well, there is a consensus document. Um, we all love a nice consensus document. It's fairly old now, it's 2013. And this is purely based on North American experience. So obviously the North Americans have led the way, not surprisingly, can't think why, um, in the, the management of Intertrigo. Obviously their client group tends to be slightly larger, although we're catching up. Um, so there is this quite good um, consensus if anybody's interested. There isn't anything at the moment similar sort of European or UK. I say at the moment because again a certain person not a million miles away is about to, well I'm finishing something off, so we are doing a European, I'm leading a European consensus at the moment, but it's a bit like herding cats. Um, but we're getting there. So hopefully by the end of the year there will be something that offers more sensible advice that's more European and UK focused, hopefully. Um, now what they um, suggest then is that a new treatment's needed in Intertrigo. So lots of different um, remedies are, are sort of formulated. Um, they actually recommend, this expert panel, use of a moisture wicking textile with silver, one of the so-called biotextiles, which have been around in the North America, North America for over 10 years. Great results. It's just coming in here. And again, if you go to the Coloplast stand, they'll probably let you have a little look and a feel. Um, it's really, really nice stuff. Um, so thinking about it then, let's imagine then this presents to you. So nice gentleman, nicely showing off his worldly wares. Um, 76 year old gentleman, he's obese, I think we worked that one out, don't need an assessment tool for that. Um, type 2 diabetic and he's continent. So your preliminary diagnosis. Intertrigo has to be, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a session on intertrigo, so it has to be intertrigo, doesn't it? Yeah. You're you're good, okay. And obviously, it's continent, so we know it can't be IAD, yeah. What's all this um, white stuff? Could be cream, could be talc. It probably is candida cream, yes. There is probably a proper name for it, isn't it? I can't remember what it is. But you know the sort of scum that candida, candida cheese. <laughs> Sorry, before coffee. Yeah. So it, it's probably a mixture. So another, you know, another lesson for you. Again, remember what goes in has got to come back out. So the more you slap stuff in there, the more you're going to be scrubbing away to get it back out again. Okay. So, vile. Okay, so how would you manage that? So you've got somebody then with rip-roaring into trigo, quite bad, all in the groin, all in the abdominal skin folds. How are you going to manage it? Okay, so good skincare, good hygiene, okay. Um, 
Just be careful with soap and water. Mm. pH balance, you've got to be kind to your <laughs> microbiome. It, it's difficult. All I would say is just be careful of soap full stop. Okay. Um, I did a study a good few years ago looking at washing with soap and water and towel drying compared to not using soap and water. And soap, basically, it's quite alkaline and you can't rinse all the residue away. So you actually make the skin more alkaline each time you wash, which upsets the microbiome. Yeah, so it's better, better to use one of the proprietary um, skin care products, skin cleansing products. You know, be it one of the all-in-one wipes, um, be it one of the foams, whatever. But obviously, if all you've got is soap and water, then, you know, fine. But it's just thinking about perhaps not using a harsh one. And obviously, at the end of the day, those of you in the community, it will be what the patient has got and what you can get your hands on. So I won't worry too much, but it's the, it's the other bits as such. Okay, so good skin hygiene. We've got to get in there, get it out. Then comes the other problem. Remember, we need to keep this area dry. And there's a real problem with drying anyway. So how would you dry... And you've got to really get into the skin folds and dry. That's why I was sort of jokingly saying, you know, two-person job. Because you've got to get right in there. I mean, obviously, a Karcher pressure washer would be fine. And then a, <laughs> and then a Dyson. Hair dryer. Actually, don't knock the hair dryer. I know we're not allowed to use them anymore, you know, because we can't be trusted. It's like we can't be trusted with toasters either, can we? Um, hair dryers are one of the best things for drying fragile skin obviously not on hot on cool <laughs> but but actually it, it works and the same study i looked at i'd looked at using hair dryers and it came out the best and there we go sorry somebody mentioned something at the front before i went off on one no Yeah, so, so drying is really, really imp important. Um, and be careful again of, of... So how do you normally dry inflamed, fragile skin? You fell into the trap. Yep, patting. Yep, so which is better? Just towel drying by rubbing or pat, pat, there, there, there. <laughs> yeah, we all... We all go, there, 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 don't we? Yeah. Actually, one of the worst things you can do. It doesn't dry the skin. It makes you feel better, but it doesn't dry the skin. So what you're doing is leaving the skin wet. So you increase the friction damage. Yeah, increase that triad of nasties. Yes, rubbing with a towel. I mean, if, if you're in hospital care, a good old NHS sandpaper towel, if you can find one. Actually makes matters worse as well. So you can't win. So we're back to the hairdryer. Yeah? Okay. Anything else? How are you going to keep the air circulating? Because that's the only thing that's going to... Or how are you going to mop up the moisture? Yeah. We can see the problems if you use talc or cream. Yeah? It's not going to work for long. How many of you might shove a towel in there or a pillowcase? Don't go, uh, people do. I'm sure some of you have. Oh, I would never put a pillowcase in there. Yeah, yeah like how. Paper towels? Gauze? No, well, let's see how many gauze squares we can shove in there. Yes? We can use that as an assessment tool, can't we? Yeah? Oh, it only took a million yesterday. Today we're down to whatever. Okay, so you can see there are, there are problems. And you're not the, not the only one. So 
the problem being there are lots of actually weird and wonderful treatments that are still promoted on websites, some professional websites, ranging from wet tea bags is one. I know, bizarre, but I suppose recycling, I suppose it's somewhere to hide them. <laughs> Saves on your waste, I suppose, but I don't know. Put all compostable waste in somebody's skin folds, I suppose. There's probably some work in there somewhere. Um, so, so, so there are problems, and you know, people talk about gauze, whatever. The problem being it only mops it up, but then stays wet. It doesn't allow the moisture to go anywhere. And that's the problem we have. So that's why this was invented, and this is the, the thing I was talking about that the North Americans have been using for about 10 years. So it's called In to Dry. It's a low friction moisture wicking fabric. And literally you just place it in the skin folds. You don't have to tape it in, you just place it there, allow it to drape out, and it wicks the moisture from the deepest recesses, allows it to evaporate, so keeps it dry. Because it's low friction, it stops the skin rubbing together. And it's got silver in it, so it kills any nasties. Win-win, you might think. Uh, not yet. Check with the Coloplast guys at Coffee, because it is changing rapidly. Um, there's certainly, some of you may be involved, some places, are, there's quite a few evaluations going on in the UK. So some of you may be involved in some of that, or may not be. Um, but so it targets all, all three things um, and the experience from so I say it can be used anywhere um, and I say the, the key though is having that bit tucking out and you know that's sometimes where there's a problem because you know what we're like as nurses yeah or oh, we'll just tuck that away it looks messy yeah or we we'll tape it down yeah no just leave it yeah it's doing its job. It needs to let the moisture evaporate. It yeah? can be used between toes, because obviously um, athlete's foot is actually a moisture-associated skin damage, or it's a type of intertrigo, but in the um, toe folds. Um, and the North American experience has been very good. So there's a whole series of case studies been done um, I won't go through all of them, but if we take, take this one. Um, so this is, I've got a feeling this is the back of somebody's knee. I think, yeah, yeah, body region, creases of the knee. Obviously, large knees, <laughs> to say the least. Um, mind you, it could be anything, couldn't it? You probably can't see from the back, so I could put anything up here and you'd just go, yeah. <laughs> um, so... Here's before um, interdry, and you can see this person then had intertrigo for 231 days, um, was being treated with antifungal ointments, not doing anything. Yeah, so that's nearly a year, not doing anything. Tried them on interdry, that's five days completely resolved. Same with that one, five days completely resolved. Um, and this is, this is the experience. So certainly within five days, there's been a dramatic reduction in all the signs and symptoms of moisture-associated skin damage. Sorry. It, it, um, it, it varies on, on the patient. You can do it daily or you can leave it in for a few days. As long as it's able to wick, it's, it's fine. And that, again, is the benefit because it saves nursing time. You're not having this daily application of, you know, what we've just talked about, cleansing, putting barrier products in, making sure it's dry. Yes, can be, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or just to just use it when there are flare-ups. But again, it's, it's working. So certainly in North America, a lot of the patients actually buy it off Amazon. 
and just self-treat as such. Um, and say, been used in a range of places that traditionally are, d are difficult. Okay, so that was a quick whiz through. Hopefully that's been of, of some use. But if anybody's got any questions, um, happily answer them. Otherwise, it's coffee time. Thank you. Thank you.